because of the um, <coughs> short time at our disposal, what I intend to do is to um, just read my introduction so that you have an idea what the paper is about or what the presentation is about. And then um, I will show you a short um, video and then I will, I will make some comments. So I will let you know when I'm ready for, for that. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I, I come from Ghana where I also uh, live and work. And um, I'm a Methodist minister and I teach in an ecumenical seminary, but I also take a very um, charismatic approach to my Christianity. Um, I grew up in the western part of Ghana, but I come from the east. Um, I don't speak the language of my people. Um, I come from Latte. I don't speak the language because um, my parents lived in the west. Um, but that's no excuse for not speaking the language. The problem was that my father would not allow us to visit our hometown, precisely because he feared that um, if you look at the extended family on both sides, both my mother's side and my father's side, his children were the ones who were uh, better educated. Uh, he wasn't very rich, but in terms of education, um, we were the children among the uh, extended family members who were most educated. And he felt that if we spend too much time in our hometown, we'll be destroyed because the people there he believed were, were witches. Now, um, because I write a lot on Pentecostalism, I have myself been disturbed by a certain simplistic approach to the issues of witchcraft. So yesterday, um, one of the sessions, I was talking about victims on both sides. Uh, not just that, even within spiritual warfare, I have seen that the issue of witchcraft now borders on issues of power and obsession with evil. And it is destroying even well-meaning ministries. So witchcraft in Africa is a means of perpetrating supernatural evil aimed at bringing others to shame and ruin. It manifests itself through decline and retrogression in life, affecting finances, marriage, businesses, and human relations. In the context of Christianity and Christian mission in Africa, it's important to understand from the outset that witchcraft is related to the devil or Satan, at least in the Christian imagination. Explaining the ever aje, ga, aye, and bei or anyeng in Akan in Ghana as activities of the devil was perhaps the only way in which Ghanaian Christians could be made to understand Satan in terms of personified evil. Belief in what has been translated as witchcraft from the indigenous terminology provided here is so strong that communities talk freely about it. Novels, video films, and popular Christian literature on witchcraft abound everywhere. Media resources, books, recorded tapes, CDs, and DVDs containing sermons and stories of deliverance from witchcraft circulate among the public helping to reinforce existing beliefs and what they mean for the lives and endeavors of people. Many of the latter come from testimonies of victims and pastors and leaders who deal with witchcraft through spiritual warfare ministries. African Christian testimonies of healing, deliverance, and conversion are overwhelmingly related to witchcraft activities, like traditional shrines, there are charismatic pastors and churches that specialize in dealing with its effect on people and society. Victims of witchcraft tend to be competitors or rivals in any endeavor. In the African discourses on witchcraft, some have come to understand the phenomenon 
as the possession of spiritual power to protect personal interests, such as one's children and property against destruction. A popular Ghanaian high-life composition even sees two sides of the phenomenon. The power to achieve great feats is also witchcraft power. Whereas the white man uses his powers constructively to invent airplanes, trains, and cars, the, ly the lyrics would say, African witchcraft is used to perpetuate evil and destroy others. In other words, for this Ghanaian musician, witchcraft is the cause of African underdevelopment and underlies much of our social problems as a society. What I do in this presentation is not rehearse our knowledge and understanding of witchcraft. It is clear that the conversion to Christianity has not resulted in the decline of the sort of demology symbolized by witchcraft. Rather, I draw attention to the reinvention of witchcraft beliefs, accusations, and the creation of new rituals and strategies using modern media. Mediated sessions of healing and deliverance have in effect changed the face of traditional televangelism. The context for these activities remain the prayer services and revival meetings of independent charismatic movements. This time, however, New African prophets minister through media, particularly television, as a way of legitimizing the superior power of the Holy Spirit or anointing on the man or woman of God at the center of exorcist rituals. There are enough studies on witchcraft that explain how it works, its means of acquisition, and from the traditional cultural perspective, how shrines and medicine cults specialize in dealing with its influence on people and society. The traditional discourse on witchcraft became part of the religious genre of African prophetic ministries and the charismatic persons at the center of what became known as the African independent churches and movements were basically persons of spiritual power. They were cherished for their ability to diagnose supernatural problems emanating from the activities of witches and prescribing the means to deal with it, with its effect within a Christian context. And as I talk to you, my own observation is that these beliefs are entrenched, they affect our politics, our economics. In the paper, I have made reference to a recent incident in Ghana in which a charismatic pastor brings to church a 50 CD note, which is our currency, and prays over it for God to deal with those demons who are leading, who are uh, causing the decline of our currency against the dollar. So as I said, it's kind of a, an obsession. And it's become, if you like, an escape route for leaders and politicians who don't want to take responsibility. The economy has lost its way. And in June, the government of Ghana has called a Thanksgiving service bringing together pastors to thank God for the nation. There's nothing wrong with it. My interpretation is that the pastors are being used because politicians don't want to do their work. So I'll just show you just a short clip, my friend, and then I'll draw just five lessons as I read these um, television um, ministries on witchcraft. The volume. It's gone off the screen. It's gone off the screen. Can we stop it and start? It's gone off the screen.
recibir esa revelación. Escucha con atención. Es madre y su hija. Okay. Now, um, as you were watching, um, I wondered whether you also um, took note of the crawlers at the bottom where the ministry was being advertised. So my reading, um, the five things that I discuss in the paper, is using these kinds of circumstances to advertise the charisma of the prophet. The second is how the media itself is changing the face of prophetic ministries. So the first is the advertisement. And I have pictures in my presentation of prophets who have their email addresses, um, um, Facebook accounts, telephone numbers, so that based on what you see on television, you can call them. It's almost like advertising a religious service. It's become a means of attraction of a following. And in one of my um, works, I have discussed the relationship between this sort of phenomena and the prosperity gospel. Because if you preach prosperity, which focuses so much on materialism, and it doesn't work for people, then witchcraft and deliverance becomes the explanation for the shortfall of deliverance. The third is prophecy as a means of diagnosing witchcraft. Because the vernacular word for prophet, in the part of the world where I come from, is odifu, made up of three words, odi something. To ye is to reveal, and fo is person. So prophet is a, 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 a revealer of secrets, more or less. And witchcraft is something that takes place in secret. So the place of the prophet is to reveal that which is hidden. And the media helps to do this. I had a discussion with one prophet after such a session. I asked him, do you know what you have done to this woman socially? I mean, even if she is possessed, do you have to do this on television? <laughs> Without any attempt to censure the picture and protect her identity. And then the testimonies of intervention. I like to be real and not just listen to pastors, but also people who say I, have be I was a victim of witchcraft to listen to their stories. And then finally, um, I, there's no time to show that, but in one of the clips I have, is the growing phenomenon of televangelism in the vernacular. And those who use the vernacular are able to communicate in ways that appeal to a certain grassroots constituency, helping to popularize this sort of uh, phenomenon. So there's a certain changing face of televangelism. The traditional televangelist comes to preach the word of God. But more and more, this is changing with the rise of new forms of what I call pneumatic Christianity that opens the field up to such prophetic activities. Thank you very much. <laughs>